Hello, it's James from xrobots.co.uk. This is part 10 of my working, walking Star Wars gonk droid. Last time I actually had this walking along, so check out that episode to see it walking forwards and walking backwards. And I put lots of trim controls on my remote so that I can trim up various parameters to stabilize it left or right, and that sort of thing. So today we're really gonna get most of the weight onto this thing before I do a final tune up. So we need to put a motor and an assembly in that actually splits the legs outwards so that it can turn on the spot. And we also need to put some speakers and some sounds in. Now this is gonna remain a bit of a cutaway droid as you might imagine for one of my projects. I was thinking about putting uh, all the panels on, but even if I put the bottom ones on from standing height, you can really only see the ankles. So the bottom's gonna remain open. There's gonna be other panels on this that house electronics, perhaps some switches, some lights, that sort of thing, and of course the speakers. But on the whole, it's gonna remain pretty open so people can see there's no one inside. I allow provision for the legs to split apart so I can turn on the spot and walk in a circle and that sort of thing. And at the moment, that mechanism is just zip tied shut. So if we cut the zip tie, we should find in fact that the legs will now split apart here. Oh, there we go, it's a bit stuck. And I did leave mounting holes as well to mount a mechanism that would push between these screws. It's only gonna to need to do it just a little bit like that. So we just need a motor and some rods that push in each direction. I've designed a little assembly here that sits at the front of the thighs. And basically this has another one of those motors and underneath that motor drives a slightly bigger gear. And that gear has got two holes in and we'll have a rod that goes from each one, one going out one way and one going the other way. So that when the gear turns, it pushes one in one direction and one in the other direction. And I've got various brackets to put this together. Obviously this surface will be printed flat on the bed. So we've got another bracket I'll solve and weld on because all the parts are ABS and this piece here, and this allows me to put a four mil piece of stainless steel through for this gear to run on. We'll have a little stopper on the bottom, and that gives me something else to brace it on and glue it into. So the parts actually need to print. Obviously the motor is um, a physical thing that doesn't need printing, so we can print all these in a one bed print. Here they come, I'm doing these in around 50% infill, so they're taking a while, it's gonna be a couple of hours, but we'll make sure they're really strong and the bits don't snap off. We'll need some levers for those to push, so I've designed these two L-shaped levers. Obviously, this is the home position, and they'll both push outwards, and I've made one with a bigger side on it. Obviously, one is at the front and one is at the back, so those both push consistently. We also need this thing at the back here, which is to hold a potentiometer so we can measure the angle, and I'm gonna put that just above one of the joints there since they both get pushed anyway, and there's lots of space in the robot to mount it there, so one part will hold the pot, the other one will hold the spindle. So here it is all assembled. I had to reprint this gear because I printed this one upside down and the hole for the captive nut was on the bottom and now it's full of support material, which I forgot I ticked. So I printed another one with a hole in the top, which is the way I did the others. So obviously these two holes, one will push one way and one will push the other as the motor runs, like so. And obviously it only has to run for a very short time, so we won't obviously run it full speed. We'll run it with PWM and we'll measure the position and just run it for a short time and just push those legs apart and together as it turns. So my levers are now installed here and if I run the motor a little bit, it should push the legs apart. And let's just put that back again. Let's just see that again. There we go. And if I put them back, they lock quite nicely. So hopefully you can just see my pot assembly here. So the pot is attached to this gray thing and the shaft is attached to the back here. So this middle piece stays still and the gray things bend backwards as the legs bend outwards. So we need to wire that into the Arduino Mega as well as a motor driver and things, but I'll be dealing with that when I come to tune up for walking. It's time to do some more to the body. So I've got these parts, which are two parts solvent welded together. And these I actually printed um, when I did the body and I never stuck them on. And these go in here and they go all the way around the bottom and you'll notice I've got a thin clamping in here to fill in the gap here. So uh, basically I'm gonna fit all of these to kind of give the body um, or the box its square shape. Now these um, would have just been solvent welded in end to end and they're quite a good fit, but uh, basically that's probably not gonna be strong enough. So I've printed some little tabs which are going to go behind there to hold them in and also across the seam line. And the thing I'm solvent welding in at the moment is a long piece of ABS print that just holds this. 
So I could actually grab this and use it as a handle if I had to, so it's reinforced all the way along the back. We'll have to see how these go. Obviously, if I do grab them, they'll probably still break if I try and support the whole weight of the robot. I was considering sticking wooden battens in there, but I thought I'd have a go with just the 3D prints first of all. So that's all setting up. It actually looks much bigger in the box than it was now, so it's changed its appearance considerably. But while I'm waiting for the acetone welds to go off, we'll look at some other bits and pieces. I mentioned the droid's going to be largely a cutaway so we can see what's going on inside, so I've actually got some panels though, they're going to be floating in those frames. So I've got some buttons on order, they haven't arrived yet, they're for arcade machines and they're fairly big. So those are going to sit in there, and uh, then I've got a number of panels here for LEDs to put some logics on there and those are going to be NeoPixels fixed in. I've also made these mounts which are basically for speakers so I can put the sounds in and a pair of those are going to sit at the front. Here are my speaker mounts which are going to be solvent welded into the inside of the frame and these are the speakers that are going to fit in there which fit quite nicely behind there and I'm actually using the insides from an active set of speakers. These were USB powered so they actually get their power from a USB plug conveniently which I can plug into the USB boost adapter that powers all the electronics and that gives me this nice little board with the volume control and the power switch. Here's my mount for the buttons which have now arrived so here they are these are ones for arcade machines um, there's place there, there's a bracket and things to fit a micro switch and also provision to illuminate them, which I may or may not do. I was going to have them so you press buttons and the lights on the front react, but I don't want people to really press the buttons all the time and get a reaction, so I'm probably just going to leave them as the plastic casing mounted in those holes. Here are my other panels, which I've already spent a very long time soldering lots of NeoPixels in, which are individually addressable RGB LEDs that are all wired together in a chain. And I've programmed up an Arduino Pro Mini here just to test them. I will eventually do a different pattern. If I power that up, we should find that all of them illuminate, and this is just the Adafruit test sketch that cycles through and colours them all in green. There we go, so those work, and they'll probably have some cycling pattern on them that goes backwards and forwards and so on. All my corners are stuck on now, and they seem pretty robust. They're good enough anyway, I think, and I've got my front panels fitted here. I think I need a bezel around this one. I'm not quite sure about these buttons, but these panels do unscrew so I can always swap them out if I'm unhappy. Around the back of the panels we've got the audio board here which has got lots of wires hanging out for audio in and the USB power I need to wire in and tidy up. We've also got the Arduino Pro Mini to power all the NeoPixels and my speakers are fitted here which are already wired into the amp. I'm going to be using this soundboard to play the sounds and this is an Adafruit sound effects board which you can just copy Og Vorbis tracks to take pins low and it'll play each one out of the audio port which is quite handy. It turns up as a USB flash drive when you plug it in so it's really easy to use. I've built this little breakout board, basically this is the USB power that would go to the speaker which I've uh, broken out there so I've got power for the soundboard, power for the Arduino Pro Mini that controls the lights and some data lines here which are going to trigger the lights and the sounds from the main Arduino Mega on the robot. Right, that looks better, pretty much like this bezel now. Obviously the buttons do nothing. I've also got some more lights around the side. So those are just cycling through some colours and so on, and when sounds activate they should all turn white. But first of all we need to get some sounds from somewhere. Gonk! Gonk! There aren't that many gong droid sounds around, so I thought it was best to make my own sounds. So now we have this one. Gunk. I've just added some reverb and some phaser and things to that. And we also have... <laughs> and the last part of that I stole from a Kraftwerk track. So now I'm going to put those on the board and we'll see how it sounds. Before I can make the buttons activate the sounds, we need to make a more compressed way of sending the data from the remote. Because when I added these knobs last time, you remember I commented that I'd actually run out of data in the Arduino buffer, and now I can't send all the knobs and all the buttons at once the way I've been doing it before. So previously, in order to read in all these buttons and all these knobs, I was reading them all in with analog or digital read, and then sending them over serial, and all of them were separate. So basically all of the um, analog controls are all 0 to 255, 
So sending all of those with commas in between, and there's lots of them, and then sending all of the buttons as zeros and ones and so on, all with commas in between. Now each of these is an integer, and every integer is two bytes, and each comma is another byte as an ASCII character. So of all of these, apparently I was exceeding the buffer length, which I believe is 64 bytes on most Arduinos, but it seemed to not work very well. So in the last episode, when I implemented all these knobs, I had to take some of the buttons away. Now there's a much more efficient way of doing this, and I'm going to do a sort of intermediate approach, where all of my buttons um, are going to still be ones and zeros, but they're going to be zipped up into a binary value. So I'm going to take basically the eight buttons that we've got there, however many, and we're going to get those values and we're going to turn those into an integer. So we're going to read them as ones and zeros, and of course with eight binary bits we can represent up to 255. So we're going to zip those all up, work out what all the ones and zeros make in binary to make one integer from zero to 255, and that will take care of all the buttons. There's eight buttons on here and one switch. So the one switch is going to have to be another integer, which will be a one or a zero. And then we've got the six uh, or so analog controls and all of those will again um, be integers of zero to 255. And that should be fine then, it doesn't exceed the buffer length. We could go a stage further than this and we could um, send everything as raw binary. And of course a value of 255 is only one byte, whereas an integer can be higher than 255, so it's two bytes stitched together. So we could actually reduce all of that again in half, but for now this is going to work fine. So now we just need to write some code that reads all these ones and zeros, turns it into a value from 0 to 255, and some code that turns it back again, and turns all the ones and zeros back into ones and zeros in separate variables or in an array. So I've written some code to test this out, and uh, basically it's all in one sketch, although it would eventually be split over the between the transmitter and the receiver. So I've got some variables here, we've got uh, eight variables called in 0 through 7, and some called out 0 through 7. And basically what I'm doing is reading in the digital ins here, and then effectively turning that into the zero, so taking those as ones and zeros and turning that into a value from zero to 255. Um, at the very start of this we set a variable called number to zero, and then based on what the digital reads are, we can uh, turn that into that variable. So obviously if the um, least significant bit is um, triggered, it adds one to it, and then if the next one is triggered, it adds 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and 128. So if they're all triggered, it turns the, the variable number into 255. If none of them are triggered, it remains at 0, and so on. So basically, it turns those binary digits into an integer. We then transmit that over serial, and read it back at the other end, as I've been doing anyway. Then we can use an Arduino function called bitread, uh, which basically reads the bit of that variable and turns those back into ones or zeros and then it basically in this sketch would print out the answer. So it's not very exciting to see if I run this sketch on an Arduino, all you see is the uh, bits getting read, turned into a, an integer and then turned straight back and printed out again, but it does prove in fact that this method works. So I need to implement the first half of this on the transmitter and the second half of this on the receiver end and all I have to do then in the middle is send one integer. So now the buttons on my remote make the sounds. So this one gonk. makes it say gonk. gonk and also makes all the lights turn white and the other one <coughs> So pretty much the only puppeteering features are moving this backwards and forwards and making sounds and that's about it. Right, we need a couple of extra cosmetic parts before we can say the cosmetics are done. Obviously it is going to be an open frame, but there's still the chance to stick things on the outside. So I'm going to get some conduit and stick them between these things, which are going to be stuck all the way around on these plates here, which will allow these to be solvent welded to the frame. So those are all going to be 3D printed. These are going to be a sort of silvery grey colour and the sticks are going to be black as usual, as with the rest of the mounts, so they sort of uh, blend in with the darkness inside. There's the first one fitted, it's just on a stick attached to the frame, and I've put some conduit in here which is going to run down clips down the side, 
and go into another one of these somewhere else. There's quite a few external things on Gonk Droids, so I think this is going to look okay. So the conduit from that top one now runs down on these nice blocks that I put on with cable ties. And it comes all the way down to the back here, so there wasn't many features on the back, so I decided I'd stick that on there. And around the front I've added one more, but with conduit that goes nowhere. I need to snip that off as well. Well, I'm pretty happy that looks like a gonk droid. I think those conduits set it off quite nicely. Well, there we go. But we have to see if it still walks with all this extra mass on it. So it almost works, but with the added mass on top, of course, that needs more force to move it. So it really needs to move slower or it's going to need more power to move it as quickly, as dynamically as it did before. So I probably need to spend a considerable amount of time, which will happen next time, on retuning it up, retuning all those dynamic timers, retuning all the PID controllers for the stability that keep it upright based on that inertial measurement unit. And you can check out the episode before last to see how I actually did that in the first place. So altogether, this isn't a terribly good way of making it work because more load, of course, stops it working until I retune it. What I really need to do is do something more intelligent, like read the joint positions as well as the IMU, or put an IMU in each leg so I can actually read those angles rather than just sort of operating blindly just with these timers that vary slightly based on stability. And that's going to be the subject of future videos. I also need to put the electronics and the code in to make those legs split so it can turn on the spot and that's going to be heavily dependent on its stability so that it basically moves those legs when it's at exactly the right time on each side so that, that pushes the robot round on the foot that's still on the ground and they come together when it's on the other foot so the body of the robot then turns around some more and those will be controls on my remote that I press to turn in each direction while it's stepping. And that means I should be able to walk forwards and backwards and turn left and right and hopefully walk in a curve. But we're going to have to spend quite some time getting that to work in the next episode. So that's all for this one. I'm pretty happy with the cosmetics that I've put on and I've still got a cutaway droid which is good so people can see how it works and they can see there's no one inside. So don't forget to subscribe for more updates on this project and other projects. And you can also check out my Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash xrobots, where you can get access to some exclusive rewards, including all my videos early and a live broadcast with me. All right, that's all for now.